the National Aeronautics and Space Administration presents Aeronautics and Space Report. Nineteen sixty eight, the year of Apollo, a year in which a decade of research and development began to be realized. The Apollo three manned spacecraft and moon rocket were proved ready for trips to the moon. Satellites like OGO, Pioneer, and Orbiting Astronomical Observatory added a wealth of scientific knowledge about our own planet Earth and the universe. Airplanes that take off and land vertically were flight tested, as well as planes without wings, prototypes of wingless spacecraft of the future. These are aeronautics and space highlights. The moon, not nearly as mysterious as it used to be, has been photographed, landed on, dug into, and chemically sampled. Surveyor 7 was the last in a series of unmanned spacecraft to land there. Reflecting on Surveyor's contributions, Dr. William Pickering, director, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Surveyor accomplished everything that we had hoped for from that mission. Five out of the seven surveyors which were launched landed successfully on the surface of the moon and operated on the surface. Uh, with the Surveyor photograph, we were able to show that uh, a landing a manned spacecraft on the moon is quite a reasonable undertaking uh, and, in, and in fact that the man will be able to walk on the surface of the moon without danger of falling through or sinking into the dust at any great depth. Uh, we were able to measure the bearing strength of the surface. We were able to get the uh, general appearance of the surface to point out that, there were, uh, that uh, in certain areas of the moon at least there were not very many large rocks which would have to be contended with. Uh, but there were, of course, numerous smaller and smaller craters. We also found the first chemical analysis of the surface of the moon by Professor Turkovich's experiment. And this showed that in the areas that we landed, the rocks, or the surface material rather, was very similar to a basalt here on the Earth. Uh, we were also able to dig in the surface and get an idea of the, uh, of the feel of the surface as uh, we went down a little bit below the surface. Uh, for a matter of a few inches, uh, the uh, material is, is very much like a soft sand to dig in. JPL is also applying its scientific know-how to Mars, flying by initially, landing and testing in the future. The experimental model of a wheel-shaped planetary landing craft is one of several landers being considered. In an effort to learn more about the possibility of life on Mars, the lab again sent a scientific team to the Antarctic. Carefully collected soil samples in this and other desert areas were returned and subjected to rigorous analysis. The sun, seething and turbulent, affecting every living thing on Earth. By studying it, we can learn more about our own environment. Interplanetary Pioneer spacecraft are doing just that. Two were launched in 1968. At one point in their voyage millions of miles into space, they passed directly behind the sun. The data being returned is helping improve weather forecasting and adding a measure of protection to moon-bound astronauts by forecasting solar activity. Also helping us learn more about the Earth's environment, orbiting geophysical observatory, OGO-5. By studying such things as our magnetic field and radiation belt, solar flares and solar wind, we gain new insight into the complex Earth-Sun relationship. Radio Astronomy Explorer, one of five Explorer-type spacecraft launched. Here, Dr. John Findlay, Chairman, U.S. Lunar and Planetary Missions Board, explains its job. An important project of the Office of Space Science and Applications this year is the Radio Astronomy Explorer satellite. While ground-based radio telescopes 
objects such as this 140-foot instrument can observe at the short radio wavelengths. The Radio Astronomy Explorer will make its measurements at wavelengths of several hundred meters. In fact, beyond the edge of the radio window. From the results of this satellite, we shall make maps of the brightness of the radio sky. And these will help us find out how our own galaxy generates and radiates radio waves. The heaviest and most sophisticated satellite to be launched in 1968 was the Orbiting Astronomical Observatory, OAO. The Earth's atmosphere limits and distorts the stars viewed by astronomers from the ground. But OAO rises above all this. Its 11 telescopes are viewing the stars with a clarity never before possible, mapping the skies and providing a better understanding of the origin of the solar system and universe. Shortly after launch, Nimbus B, an experimental weather satellite, plunged into the Pacific just off the coast of California when a gyroscope malfunctioned. Divers recovered two valuable nuclear-powered generators about 300 feet down. Advanced research and technology moved ahead on many fronts in 1968. The wingless HL-10 lifting body made 13 flights, including two with sustained rocket propulsion. The flat iron-shaped craft gets its aerodynamic lift from the wingless body shape. Lifting bodies show promise as reusable spacecraft of the future, spacecraft that can land like conventional airplanes. After nine years and nearly 200 flights to the edge of space, the rocket-powered X-15 program was brought to a close with eight final flights in 1968. The half-plane, half-rocket X-15 has been a unique flying test bed for researching aeronautics and space problems. The giant XB-70, flying at three times the speed of sound, made 13 research flights, gathering data for use in the development of large supersonic aircraft. NASA also conducted extensive flight studies on several types of vertical takeoff and landing planes. VTOL, as they are called, are craft that can rise vertically, then fly forward like any other airplane. VTOLs may one day be used as intercity transports, improving short-haul air transportation. Much aeronautical research is done with models. In this particular test, a highly instrumented model is dropped from a helicopter, then flown by radio control from the ground. This type of study makes the most rigorous test possible without endangering valuable planes. Jet aircraft noise is a continuing national problem. NASA has been attacking the problem in two ways. First, by attempting to design a new, quieter engine, and second, by modifying existing engines so they make less noise. On this plane, engineers at the Lewis Research Center in Cleveland are trying out various engine modifications to determine the effect on the plane's performance. It has been found that by cutting grooves in airport runways, Planes landing on rain-soaked surfaces can land with less chance of skidding and stop easier. These studies were continued in 1968. Some of the braking tests were made with specially instrumented cars on the grooved runways. The results now appear to have application to highways as well as airport landing strips. At the Nuclear Rocket Development Station in Nevada, NASA, in cooperation with the Atomic Energy Commission, test-fired a powerful nuclear rocket reactor. The tests are part of an effort to develop nuclear-powered rockets for future deep space exploration. Apollo can be likened to a finely tuned watch. Men and space machines are perfected to the highest degree possible. 
In most cases, the astronauts who fly the spacecraft train separately, but concurrent with the build-up and development of the space machines themselves. When brought together, they must mesh smoothly. There is little room for error. Apollo is like this, and the men who fly and the men who build know it. There were four Apollo flights in 1968, two unmanned, two manned, all part of the preparation for moon landings. Apollo 5 sent aloft to check out the lunar module. It is in a lunar module that two astronauts will land and take off from the moon. Both the descent engine, used to slow the spacecraft for the landing, and the ascent engine, which will boost the pair off the moon, were successfully tested. To further ready the Saturn V rocket and its many components, the unmanned Apollo 6 was launched into Earth orbit. Engineering cameras on board recorded the first stage and interstage separations. After 10 hours in space, the command module was rammed back into the Earth's atmosphere, simulating a lunar return, another milestone in preparing for moon missions. The next step, check out the spacecraft with men aboard. Here, astronauts Shira, Cunningham, and Isley move about weightlessly in their Apollo 7 spacecraft. This was also the first full dress rehearsal for the manned space flight tracking network. 14 ground stations located in such places as Bermuda, Australia, Spain, and Hawaii, together with planes and tracking ships, kept a constant electronic ear tuned to the Apollo spacecraft. After 10 days and 163 revolutions, Apollo 7 splashed down in the Pacific, paving the way for the first half million mile journey to the moon and back. From Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center, the Saturn V rocket boosted Apollo 8 astronauts, Borman, Lovell, and Anders toward their rendezvous with the moon. The first time the big rocket was flown with men as passengers. While en route, the crew kept busy checking and double checking all systems as they sped toward the moon. Many of the things they did will have a direct bearing on future lunar missions. Nearly three days and 230,000 miles later, the crew of Apollo 8 fired their rocket engine, placing them in lunar orbit. Here are some of the views recorded by the crew as they orbited the moon 10 times. Views from afar and close up, showing remarkable detail. The kind of detail needed before men land there. Then the cameras and spacecraft were turned toward Earth. And after three days and a fiery re-entry, landed in the Pacific within sight of the recovery ship. Apollo 8, final flight of the year, historic prelude to lunar landings and to the peaceful exploration of space in the future. This has been an Aeronautics and Space Report presented by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. <laughs>